Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Thursday, July 9th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Our New Testament reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Now at Iconium they gathered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, like The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven, and a fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. And our Book of Concord reading this evening is from the Small Called Articles. We are actually beginning the Small Called Articles themselves tonight. So we will be reading Article 1, as well as the beginning parts of Article 2. Article 1. The first part of the Articles deals with the lofty Articles of the Divine Majesty, namely, 1. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons in one divine essence and nature, is one God who created heaven and earth, etc. 
Number two, that the Father was begotten by no one, the Son was begotten by the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Three, that neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit but the Son became a human being. Number four, that the Son became a human being in this way. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit without male participation and was born of the pure Holy Virgin Mary. After that, he suffered, died, was buried, descended into hell, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, in the future will come to judge the living and the dead, etc., as the apostles in the Athanasian creeds and the common children's catechism teach. These articles are not matters of dispute or conflict, for both sides confess them. Therefore, it is not necessary to deal with them at greater length now. Part 2. The second part is about the articles that pertain to the office and work of Jesus Christ or to our redemption. Here is the first and chief article. That Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Romans 4.25 And he alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, 6. Furthermore, all have sinned, and they are now justified without merit, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus by his blood, Romans 3, 23 to 25. Now, because this must be believed and may not be obtained or grasped otherwise with any work, law, or merit, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. As St. Paul says in Romans 3, 28, 26, For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law, and also that God alone is righteous and justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Nothing in this article can be conceded or given up, even if heaven and earth or whatever is transitory passed away. As St. Peter says in Acts 4, 12, There is no other name given among mortals by which we must be saved, and by his bruises we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. On this article stands all that we teach and practice against the Pope, the devil, and the world. Therefore, we must be quite certain and have no doubt about it. Otherwise, everything is lost, and the Pope and the devil and whatever opposes us will gain victory and be proved right. The second article. That the Mass, under the papacy, has to be the greatest and most terrible abomination as it directly and violently opposes this chief article. In spite of this, it has been the supreme and most precious of all the various papal idolatries, for it is held that this sacrifice or work of the Mass, even when performed by a rotten scoundrel, delivers people both from sin here in this life and beyond in purgatory, even though the Lamb of God alone should and must do this, as mentioned above. Nothing is to be conceded or compromised in this article either, because the first article does not allow it. And wherever there might be reasonable papists, a person would want to speak with them in a friendly way like this. Why do you cling so tenaciously to the Mass? 1. After all, it is nothing but a mere human invention not commanded by God. And we may discard all human inventions, as Christ says in Matthew 15.9. In vain do they worship me with human precepts. 2. It is an unnecessary thing that you can easily omit without sin or danger. 3. You can receive the sacrament in a much better and more blessed way. Indeed, it is the only blessed way. When you receive it according to Christ's institution. Why do you want to force the world into misery and destitution for the sake of unnecessary fabrications? especially when the sacraments can be had in another better and more blessed way. Let it be publicly preached to the people that the Mass, as a human trifle, may be discontinued without sin and that no one will be damned who does not observe it, but may in fact be saved in a better way without the Mass. What do you want to bet that the Mass falls of its own accord, not only among the mad mob, but also among all the upright, Christian, reasonable, and God-fearing hearts? How much more would this be the case were they to hear that the Mass is a dangerous thing, fabricated and invented without God's word and will? I will pause right there very briefly, uh, because if you read uh, the Augsburg Confession, you will see a section that says, 
uh, we Lutherans do not abolish the Mass, uh, and we do not. Uh, we do uh, correct it and correct it from the errors that Luther is pointing out here in these articles. And we don't use the word Mass because it means something different to Roman Catholics than it does to us. Uh, so we just kind of abandoned that word uh, because if you both use a word and you both have different definitions, then you may think you both believe the same thing and we do not. What Luther is speaking to here is what uh, Roman Catholicism still does to this day. The priest is re-sacrificing Jesus to God as propitiation for our sins. Uh, and that is, of course, not uh, correct, is not uh, what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus died once for all for the sins of the world. Uh, there is no human work in re-sacrificing God to God. When you think of it that way, you can see that it is clearly uh, mistaken. So that's what Luther is talking about, about the Mass, is this uh, making it a work of men done uh, for God to earn salvation. We continue. Article 4, or point 4. Because such innumerable unspeakable abuses have risen throughout the whole world with the buying and selling of masses, they should be properly be abandoned, if only to curb such abuses, even if in and of themselves masses did contain something useful and good. How much the more should they be abandoned in order to guard forever against such abuses, since the masses are completely unnecessary, useless, and dangerous, and everything can be had in a more necessary, useful, and certain matter without the mass? Uh, here Luther is talking about the sale of masses for the dead, requ requiem masses, uh, that if you said these, you paid the priest to say these, and he would rattle them off privately by himself in a corner chapel in front of an altar, and his saying of those would earn the soul for whom he is praying time off of purgatory. Uh, that is what he's talking about in point four. Point five. As the canon of the mass in all the handbooks say, the Mass is and can be nothing but a human work, even a work of rotten scoundrels, performed in order that individuals might reconcile themselves and others to God, acquire the forgiveness of sins, and merit grace. When the Mass is observed in the very best possible way, it is observed with these intentions. What purpose would it otherwise have? Thus the Mass should and must be condemned and repudiated, because it is directly contrary to the chief article, which says that it is not an evil or devout servant of the Mass with his work, but rather the Lamb of God, the Son of God, who takes away our sin. John 1, 29. If some want to justify their position by saying that they want to commune themselves for the sake of their own devotion, they cannot be taken seriously. For if they seriously desire to commune, then they do so with certainty and in the best way by using the sacrament administered according to Christ's institution. On the contrary, to commune oneself is a human notion, uncertain, unnecessary, and even forbidden. And again, here Luther is talking about a priest communing by himself, not communing himself in the congregation, which is actually the traditional practice, but communing himself alone doing one of these private masses. Again, it is a work that uh, he believes he is doing for God. Thus, it is not right, even if everything else were otherwise in order, to use the common sacrament of the Church for one's own devotional life and to play with it according to one's own pleasure apart from God's Word and outside the Church community. This article on the Mass will be the decisive issue in the Council because, were it possible for them to give in to us on every other article, they could not give up on this one. As Compegio said at Augsburg, he would sooner allow himself to be torn to pieces before he would abandon the Mass. In the same way, I too, with God's help, would sooner allow myself to be burned to ashes before I would allow a servant of the Mass, whether good or evil, and his work to be equal to or greater than my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thus we are and remain eternally divided and opposed to one another. They are well aware that if the Mass falls, the papacy falls. Before they would allow that to happen, they would kill us all if they could do it. Besides all this, this dragon's tail, the mass, has produced many noxious maggots and the excrement of various idolatries. First, purgatory. 
Here they traded in purgatory with masses for the dead and vigils after seven days, thirty days, and a year, and finally with the common week, All Souls Day, and soul baths, so that the mass is only used on behalf of the dead, although Christ instituted the sacrament only for the living. Purgatory, therefore, with all its pomp, requiem masses, and transactions, is to be regarded as an apparition of the devil. For it, too, is against the chief article that Christ alone, and not human works, is to help souls. Besides, concerning the dead, we have received neither command nor instruction. For these reasons, it may be best to abandon it, even if it were neither error nor idolatry. At this point, the papists cite Augustine and some of the fathers who have supposedly written about purgatory. They suppose that we do not see why and how they use such passages. St. Augustine does not write that here is a, there is a purgatory, and cites no passage of scripture that persuades him to adopt such a position. Instead, he leaves it undecided whether there is a pur purgatory or not, and says simply that his mother asked to be remembered at the altar, or sacrament. Now, all of this is nothing but the human opinions of a few individuals, who can establish no article of faith, something God alone can do. But our papists employ such human words in order to make people believe in their shameful, blasphemous, accursed fairs of masses, offered up into purgatory for the souls of the dead, etc. They will never prove such a thing from Augustine. When they have given up their purgatorial mass fairs, something Augustine never dreamed of, then we will discuss with them whether St. Augustine's word lacking support from Scripture may be tolerated and whether the dead may be commemorated at the sacrament. It will not do to formulate articles of faith on the basis of the Holy Father's works or words, otherwise their food, clothes, houses, etc. would also have to be articles of faith, as has been done with relics. This means that the Word of God and no one else, not even an angel, should establish articles of faith. Uh, see Galatians 1.8. And that is where we will end this evening, and we will pick that up uh, at that point tomorrow. Now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, 
strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O Eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, in our bold proclamation of the gospel, give us humility to know that those who hear us hear you, that those who preach and administer the sacraments stand in your stead and by your command, and that whatever fruit is produced through our work comes from your gracious hand. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.